Welcome to Beyond Wall Street, presented by Arixa Capital, where expert investors make their unique investment strategies easy to understand. I'm your host, Jan Bresky, and today I'm talking with Jill Alia of Corbell Real Estate. We'll be discussing developing apartment buildings in Los Angeles. Jill, it's such a pleasure to have you today. Welcome to our interview series, Beyond Wall Street. It's great to be here today. Nice to see you. I'm really excited for today's interview and to hear about your real estate development projects and and just talk about your career as well. So why don't we start with that? Can you maybe spend a minute talking about your background uh, before you became a real estate developer? And then let's we'll get into your current activity, too. So I actually started out in strategy consulting, although I always had a foot in real estate as my family is involved in real estate and is something that was always interesting to me. Um, and then after some time I made the move to do real estate full time. So I spent, um, quite a while at BlackRock, uh, in the real estate private equity group as a portfolio manager, and then eventually made my way over to the operational side, heading up asset management at Meyer Bergman and, uh, doing multifamily development. Terrific. So you mentioned at BlackRock initially, what was your first job there? When I first began, I was a uh, associate right out of business school in the uh, portfolio management and asset management functions within the real estate private equity group. How about the, your current path as you're a developer? When did you start with that? So it actually began while I was at BlackRock. So again, I was there for over 10 years. And that's really where I got my first experience with development. I did some multifamily development. We did a major retail development project, several condo conversions in New York City. So it really ran the gamut. When did you launch your own separate company focusing on being the developer uh, versus working as part of the development team at BlackRock? After BlackRock, I went to Meyer Bergman. From there, we formed Corbell Real Estate, which focuses on multifamily development. And if you could maybe talk about one of your current projects, that'd be great. Sure. I can talk about one of the projects that we recently did, a multifamily development in uh, Los Angeles, right near Exposition Park in USC. This was a ground up development, 42 units in Los Angeles. There's a transit oriented incentive program. So what we found here in this area right near USC was um, great proximity to public transportation, walking distance actually to two metro stops, in addition to a bunch of multifamily development going on in the area. So that combined with this proximity to public transit and the development incentives that go along with that made this a very attractive opportunity for us. So LA is in the process of building a lot of new metro stations. I think the the rally cry was 28 by 28, right? 28 new stations by 2028, which is when the Olympics are going to be here in Los Angeles. Uh So it would seem like there are massive numbers of opportunities to develop near new metro stations in areas that weren't transit oriented before, but now they will be. Are you bullish on that opportunity? Do you you think that Los Angeles will support and absorb all that new construction? I am. I think that... um... Listen, there's, you know, a housing shortage uh, in the state in general, but I think that there is a lot of um, a lot of demand, and that there's a lot of capacity to absorb, you know, all the development that we have underway, and you know, much more that we don't have underway. Okay, let's dive into the numbers a little bit. So, when you're developing a new apartment property. What's the key financial metric that you look at to determine whether it's viable? I, I know there's a metric called the cap rate that you build to, the build to right. capitalization rate. Is that is that an important metric for you or is there another one that's sort of your key driver? Well, it depends on the particular project and who our investors are. But I would say we are typically building to a high teen IRR. Um, and now cap rate definitely is the most important metric that goes into that, I would say, Um, you know, and um, just knowing that, and I don't know if everyone knows (laughs) what uh, a cap rate is, but, you know, it is a measure of pricing, you know, as it relates to income from the property. 
And, um, and so that, that is going to determine where you can, what you can sell it at eventually. It's going to determine where you can finance it. Um, so it obviously is, you know, of course, a very, you know, if not the most important metric. So you're looking to get uh, an internal rate of return in the height in the high teens over the holding period. And what kind of holding period do you typically plan on? I hate to caveat everything with it depends on the particular deal, but it does. So, for example, um, we have had a focus on opportunity zone projects. This is an economic development tool that allows people to invest in distressed areas across the country um, for the purpose of economic growth in these communities. And then the incentives to investors for doing that is in the form of tax benefits. Well, for our Opportunity Zone projects, it's what we're underwriting as a 10-year hold. These are projects we plan to hold for, you know, for 10 years or more. Um, in order to achieve the uh, tax benefits for our investors. If it's a non-opportunity zone project, that is, it's likely not a 10-year hold. It's likely something closer to five years. How many projects do you think you'll be doing in the coming years per year? And what percentage of your projects do you think will be opportunity zone locations sure. versus not? In terms of new projects, I would say, you know, we're looking at two per year. And I um, would estimate that half of that is an opportunity zones and half is not. And so, and you're looking for that high IRR return, really either way, whether it's in an opportunity zone with a 10-year hold or not in an opportunity zone and right. maybe more like a five-year hold. Right. Okay. So with the pandemic, a lot more people are able to work from home part of the time or all of the time. And it seems like the the um, rebirth of the urban core is kind of went into reverse a little bit during COVID. So people wanted to get out of the urban core to some extent, and find some space. But what, how, how do you think that affects development in LA uh, versus development in maybe other places, smaller cities? Are you, would you consider working outside of LA or are you really laser focused on LA as, as a, the place to develop? I do have real estate in other states and other cities. LA is still my primary focus right now for multifamily development. Although there are definitely people moving to more suburban areas, there's more rural areas out of state. I mean, you know, California hasn't had positive population growth, you know, for a while now. So even pre-pandemic, so that is. Um, Telling. It's an expensive place to live, you know, even before all of this. Um, but I, you know, from my own perspective and you know our perspective in terms of what we're investing in, we still believe in the city and the demand. Um, so we're still focused on development there. Okay, very good. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Jill, tell me one thing that you like a lot about your career and your job and your investment focus. One of one of your favorite things about what you do generally. Well, for me, I am definitely an analytical mindset. That's how I've always been. That's the way my my brain works. Um, and to be able to combine that with just what I find inherently interesting about real estate and um, has always been something I you know, very much enjoyed and what led me into this career in the first place. And then in development in particular, it's taking all of that and then having the you know satisfaction of watching, of having a vision and watching it create and fulfilled. And you know, what you then go by the building and you think, wow, that used to be an empty lot. <laughs> I, you know, and we created this, and that is um, that's you know been very satisfying and I enjoy a lot. And then on the other side, what's one thing that is um either a risk to the investment strategy or a challenge, a challenge of the career track that you've chosen? I would say you come up with your assumptions and when you're forecasting how you think something's going to do. And with development, there's a lot more assumptions, right? Because we are forecasting our costs with the best information we have. 
And then, you know, once it is built, we're forecasting how it's going to operate and it's understanding and, you know, all of the different risks. And there's so many different levers and whether it's something that could get delayed by two months, but then what does that mean? That delay of two months can affect your, you know, the, um, your carrying costs and your debt service costs. And um, there could be material cost to material change there. You know, there's so much that can change um, in every metric and every assumption line item. Um, so that of course has its challenges, but we, you know, we live and we learn and you do this enough times and hopefully you get, um, you know, better and more accurate at your forecasting. Jill, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Jill Aliyah from Corbell Real Estate. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. It was great speaking with you today. I'm Jan Bresky, and you've been listening to Beyond Wall Street.